this morning. One thing that we have in Dancer, this is why we live here. We have great springs, we have great falls. A yeah. little bit too much heat sometimes in the summer, and we won't talk about winter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have everyone here this morning. Uh, for announcements, <clears throat> take note of one uh, that's a little bit out of ordinary, and that's on the 26th. Summer potluck following service. I will always make announcement of those because I'd like everyone to know about that and bring their favorite foods and I will be glad to sample them. But um, it's always a good time to have a potluck. Great time of fellowship uh, together. Our psalm today is a psalm of David, Psalm 8. And as I read the psalm, and we reflect on it, the first and the last verse are just why we're here this morning. And, uh, well, I will read it. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, your name is indeed majestic. We look at this Trinity Sunday, we see the incomprehensible aspects and of your greatness, Father. And we praise you, we thank you, we worship you, we glorify you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you have given wonderful and great gifts to all the people of the earth. And you have given salvation to all those who put their faith and trust in you. Father, this morning as we worship you, may our worship be from a pure heart that desires to worship, to glorify and honor you. May we put aside the cares and things of the day to focus on you. And I pray that you, Father, will be honored in everything that we do this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me for two songs that truly worship God. Holy, 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 and we will glorify.
Please be seated. Our reading today is from the book of Acts. Last week, the message was about Pentecost, and we talked about the results of Pentecost, that there were 3,000 saved after Peter's message that day. I'm going to read here the heart of Peter's message on Pentecost from Acts 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. Let all the house of Israel therefore Know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let's pray to the Lord now and let's begin with a prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Dear Father, thank you this morning that you've allowed us to be here. You've called us to be here, and we are here, and we thank you and praise you, Lord. I want to pray today for the CLBA convention that starts this week, for the decisions that will be made that will further Christ's Christ kingdom and, and enhance the work of the denomination. Pray for a safe trip for Pastor Steve and Doreen as they travel to the convention. And Father, we want to pray for a situation in the world. We pray for peace. And we want to pray particularly for safety for Christians that are in harm's way. Thank you particularly today about the Ukraine and about those in Nigeria where a genocide of sorts has been taking place for some time. And Father, we pray for wisdom. For our nation's leaders. We pray, Father, that 
they might use the principles of God's word to make sound decisions, that politicians might humble themselves and turn to Jesus for strength, for wisdom. Pray, Father, for those in our congregation who have difficult choices to make, and those who need your comfort and your healing. We pray for Marty this morning. We pray for Jim Johnson, Jim Cup, all of whom are struggling with various health issues. Father, give them peace and give them encouragement this morning, that kind of encouragement that only you can give. And for those among us who are struggling with unspoken issues, who need your direction, and who also need your comfort and your encouragement. Father, we thank you for the funds that have been collected for the Joseph Project and for pregnancy options. May they make a difference in our world, Lord. We want to see, uh, we want to see young people that uh, understand that there is a choice when it comes to pregnancy issues, Lord. They don't have to follow the world. And so we pray that pregnancy options will continue to do the, the wonderful job that it's doing. And we pray, Father, for the those within the Joseph Project in the village of Chad in Africa, Father, that, uh, that this building will be built soon, that the grain will have safe and secure storage and that it will benefit these people greatly. And we pray that out of this, people might come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And now, Father, as Pastor Dan comes and brings us today's message for the children first, and then for all of us, pray you give him exactly the words that we need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, while they're working that out, I'll talk to you. You know, if you're uh, born into a family, there's one thing that's going to happen to you, whether you like it or not. You're going to end up looking like your family. I mean, that is just true. And, and so if you're one of the Kino kids, you know what's going to happen? As you get older, people are going to say, oh, you must be one of the Keno family, because you look like them. Um, and sometimes it's a dad, sometimes it's a mom. Did you get, oh, you did, got, got it up there. I, I put this up here, because this is the best example I've ever seen of it. Now, this, by the way, is my favorite wedding picture, easily, 52 years ago. But you look at those two. Now, they're, they're, you know, there are probably not more than uh, Few people here who ever knew my wife's dad. Um, he's, he's been in heaven a long time. But you know that family, the Simonson family, they all look, well no, most of them look like, like dad. They do. Judy looks like that. And the older she gets, the more she, she looks like him. I mean, that is just true. Um, that's just part of being part of a family. Um, it's also true, you know, in appearance. You know, there's, you know, it, it's usually that's the way people see it. But if people really get to know family, often there are family characteristics that even aren't appearance, but they're there. Um, Judy's family, it's, it's true of Judy and Doreen and, and, you know, most, of, not all the family, they like numbers. <laughs> they just like numbers. They like rules. They like, you know, ways of being, this is the way it's done. Um, these are all good things. Um, they like mechanics. You know, they, they, they can fix things. 
and they're friendly. I mean, that's just the whole family. I can mention some other stuff. Uh, and they're all really good things. And you know, even though, you know, you know, our daughter Tisha was adopted, and so she doesn't have the fair physical characteristics of our family. And yet people who know her knows that there are some characteristics of the Lizicki family that she's got. You know, they, they kind of expressions and, and stuff like that, a little bit of personality and things. Um, it just happens. If you wanted, you, you know, you know, just a few of you knew Judy Stack, but if you want to, to really know more Simonson, all you have to do is to get to know Judy and Doreen. You know them very well, you know their dad. That's just the way it is. Now, the reason I tell you this is that God's family is the same way. Now, I'm not talking about the church. Usually when we talk about God's family, we're talking about the church. Now, it is true there too, but this is family. When I talk about God's family, today is called Holy Trinity Sunday. What that means is that God, that we know is God, has got three persons in this one God. And I don't ask me to explain it, I can't. But the fact is, is that it's true. Three persons, three personalities, they're all the same in some ways. They're absolutely different in other ways. The things that they do um, in heart and in mind, they are exactly the same. God told his people at the very beginning, people of Israel, he said, you will not make a a." a image of me, a picture of me, a, um, you won't make, um, you know, idols out of wood and stone to represent me. You won't look up at the stars and say, oh, that's what God is you know, like and all this kind of, you will not do that. If you do that, you're going to, you're going to mess up my reputation. But what did God do? He made the image. perfect and his name is Jesus so if you want to know about God about what he's like who he is and those things always look at Jesus and you've got a perfect pictures even better than Judy and her dad <coughs> We're going to sing a nice little praise song that has to do with God is Trinity. Father, I adore you. Let's stand and sing. the day that the church focuses on that wonderful fact the scripture you know the word trinity doesn't exist in the scriptures but it's the only way that the church through the generations the only way that they they, they could a word they could invent that that would explain it try three unity one I mean that, that's what it's about 
It lies at the very heart of the Christian religion. All of the groups that, that, that even though they call themselves Christian and they deny it, we don't recognize as being really authentic Christian because they deny that, that, that significant truth. And therefore, the most significant question that the, that the Christian faith uh, is, uh, uh, has to deal with, historically, who is Jesus? He is the key to all of the, what Eugene Peterson likes to call the invisible graces. The things that draw us to the Christian faith. How can we have peace with God? How can we have an eternal hope? How can we know we are, our life is meaningful? How can we know that in judgment we will stand in righteousness? How can we know the truth about God, about ourselves, about life and death? I mean, you know, and a lot of other things. But these are the things that have drawn us to, uh, to Christianity. Jesus is the key to all of them. Now, in, in, in John, the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapters 6, 7, and 8, John records debates between Jesus and his enemies. They are no holds barred. It's unbelievable what you hear, not only them saying, but hear Jesus saying about them. In those debates, his opponents are trying to make him answer the question, who are you? Specifically, do you claim to be our Messiah, our Christ? Who are you? And throughout the whole uh, debate, Jesus is drawing them to a conclusion. Forcing them to face this conclusion about who he is. Now, John did not record these chapters so that we would have some more information. We do, but that's not how he did it. He didn't even record them so that we can be his rooting section, you know, for Jesus. John recorded these chapters so that you will enter the debate yourself. And John wants to see you come to the conclusion that he puts in his 20th chapters in the end of his book, when he said, I wrote these things to you so that you might come to believe that Jesus is Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and believing you will have life in his name. And so he wants you to enter into the debate. Think it through. At the end of that debate, this is what, this, this is what concludes it. Talk about dramatically, it does. So they've been debating, and finally it says, the Jews answered him. Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan? That was the worst insult they could think of. And have a demon. You're demon possessed. You're lunatic. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. <laughs> the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, the one of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say that I do not know Him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your, fa your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Wow. What is this I am business? Very prominent in the Bible, certainly in the book of John. There are two Greek words, echo, me. And every time Jesus would, would say this, which he did a number of times, he always used those exact two words. Now you can say I am without the first of them. Amy says I am. And people do and did. But when Jesus talked about himself, he always put the second, the, the first word. He always was very emphatic. I am. M. He's talking about himself. Where does that come from? You know, we talk about, we have a little gospel song. And it comes right out of the Bible. Yesterday, today, forever. Well, it comes out of ancient biblical history. First time we find it recorded, Jesus has appeared to Abraham. said that I am. He said that Abraham rejoiced to see me. And we don't know exactly which incidents in Abraham's life he's referring to, but it happened. And then with Moses, Moses was in the desert. He had escaped from Egypt and he was living in the desert and God called him and he came in the desert and he came to a bush that was burning and it just didn't burn. It just kept on burning, but it wasn't consumed. And God told him to take off your sandals. This is holy ground. And then he told him, I'm sending you back to Egypt. And, and Moses got into kind of an argument with Jesus, with God. <laughs> he said, you know, he didn't want to go. But he said, you're going back. And, and, and one of Moses' arguments was basically, who am I going to say sent me? You see that people had been in, 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 in Egypt for 400 years. They were no longer worshiping the Jehovah of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. And, and, so, and so Moses said, who do I say sent me? Which, which God is it? And God said, you tell them, I am sent you. The one and only God who exists, has always exists and always will, he is eternal. The amazing thing is, what Jesus is saying, the God who met Abraham, the God who met Moses at the burning bush, Jesus said, I 
am that God. And that's why I want at the end of this debate and he said, I am. They picked up stones because blasphemy, that was the Old Testament law for people who blaspheme, you stone them to death. And so that's what they picked up the stones, they were going to kill him. How dare you, you being a man, have made yourself out to be God. Well, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. You've seen me, you have seen the Father. John puts his kind of benediction on this whole thing. The beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only, uh, you know, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No man has ever seen God, but God, the Son who's at the Father's side, has made him known. You see, John is calling you into the debate. C.S. Lewis made an interesting statement. It's, it might be the most famous thing he ever said. When he said that you can call Jesus a liar, and, and that's what the Jews were doing. You can call him a lunatic, and that's what they were doing. But you can't say anything else about him except he is the Son of God. Because no man could say what he said and be anything but a liar, a lunatic, or he's telling the truth. And that is the, well, that's the conclusion that God is calling every one of us to make. I am. That means that his word has divine authority. And he said, he who keeps my word, and then made an unbelievable statement, except that it's true. But, you know, I was talking to my, to my son this last week. I, I told him that what I was preaching on, and he said, Dad, did you realize it? And he told me something that after all my years of ministry, I never, I'd never realized this. You remember the story about when Jesus, on the night before he died, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and this mob came after him. They were the Jewish religious and political authorities were heading this mob. There were Roman soldiers and temple guards. They were in the mob and then just a mob of unruly people who came in the middle of the night for, to see the excitement. And when they came up, this mob came up to Jesus late at night in the garden and they came up to him and said, uh, and Jesus said to them, well, who are you looking for? And, and, and Jesus answered. And the one thing I never understood is that they acted as like they'd seen a ghost. They, they, in trying to get away from him, they were falling all over each other to get away. Why? Well, you see, in your version of the Bible, every version I've ever seen, when they say, who are you seeking? And, he, and they would say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. Only he didn't say, I am he. He said, I am. The translations put the he in the other end because he was identifying himself as the, you know, Jesus of Nazareth. So it's not bad to do that. But that's all he said was, I am. His word has divine authority. It has power. And he said, he who keeps my word. What does it mean to keep his word? You know, the, it's, it, it's, it's easy to think right away, well, that must mean to obey everything he says. In which case, 
everything that came after that, all the, the rewards, well, we might as well forget it because there ain't one of us who's, who can do it. That's not what it means. It's certainly honoring what he said, but I can't keep the law. Does it mean that in our creed, which we're going to confess and later on in the service, you know, um, does it mean that I believe? I mean, I, I, I believe that, that we make that creed. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, it certainly does mean that, but it goes beyond that. The world is full of people who might make that confession. What it means beyond making that confession is that by faith I embrace in my heart his word and I embrace it as his gift to me. That's what it means to keep his word. And he said that the one who keeps my word will never see or taste death. He said it someplace else in John, he said those who do have, not will have, that's future, have in the present eternal life. Even if they die, as he said to Martha, in Christ, I, I am because he is. But that wasn't all. Throughout the book of John, there were, he lists seven different times when Jesus would say, I am, again, I am. The God of the Old Testament, the God of, you know, I am. And then he would say, I am the good shepherd. I am the door into the kingdom of God. I am the bread that gives and sustains eternal life. I am the true vine that, that, that is the source of spiritual uh, fruit, fruitful life. I am the light that gives light to the world that I can see as God sees. I am the resurrection and the life so that I, that, that I have that I have the life now, and I have the hope of a resurrection from the dead. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then one that John didn't record, Matthew did. I am with you always. Present tense. Now, what is he saying? He's saying those who keep my word. They have the ability to come to know Jesus as each one of these things that he promised. I can know him as my good shepherd. I can know him as my divine, you know, all those things. Beautiful stuff. This is a living, growing relationship. You know, John, as well as the other apostles, their Bible was the Old Testament. Their Bible really, the Old Testament, became alive to them when they began to see that Jesus was the center of the Old Testament. That it spoke of Jesus. And so they would say, when they were talking in their Gospels about Jesus, they would say, this came to fulfill the prophecy. Because Jesus was the center. The Old Testament will become absolutely alive to you, as it was to the apostles, when you learn to see Jesus in the middle of it. That was given, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament, it was all given in local context. A certain time, certain place, 
certain language, culture, situations, and yet, the word is alive to every one of us. Think about this. In the Old Testament, what did they do? They had all of these animal sacrifices that they would bring to God. What were they? They were the appetizers of a feast to which you and I are invited to today. Jesus' sacrifice, his cross, his body and blood that we celebrate in all the community. And so we're going to celebrate Holy Communion this morning. I was talking to a guy recently who was telling me about his church. And he said, you know, that, that the pastor is kind of talking to a broad audience. And this guy knows the Bible very well. He says he talks to kind of a broad audience. And I have to admit that I really don't learn anything much new from his preaching. But he said, I really like my church. Because in his preaching and in the music and the prayers and all that, it confirms what I believe. It reminds me of what I believe. It challenges me about what I believe. And I thought about it as kind of like a meals. You know, everything my wife fixes for me is familiar. Now, I, I get terrific variety. But the foods, you know, they're all familiar. When was the last time, Judy, you've ever made something that was absolutely new? I mean, how could it be? The food, you know, it, it, it can happen, but it's very rare. But you know something? I need to eat those me that meal every day. And I love it. But it's all familiar. That's what this man was saying about his church. What did Jesus say? To his disciples on that fateful evening. Talking about it was the evening when the Jews celebrated the Passover of the, you know, when they were gotten out of Egypt and they sacrificed a lamb. And Jesus said, Whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you do it not in remembrance of the Passover but in remembrance of me. Jesus said, the one who said, I am, he said, this is my body. This is my blood. Paul took up the same idea and he said, this is a participation feast in the body and the blood of Jesus. The word of God, the bread, the cup are in, in a way that nobody really understands. They are inhabited by the spirit of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. It is the basis of all the invisible grace of God. The basis, it's the reason why God the Father can forgive us of our sin. The reason why, in judgment, we will stand as righteous people in Christ. It opens the door to all of the I am's. The good shepherd, the vine, the bread. This is his intercession for us that gives us access to God the Father in prayer. Remember it. Bring a sacrifice back into the present. There were 
Old Testament, they call them feasts. They're all spiritual things. And there are three main ones. And you know why they call them a feast? Because they brought sacrifices, animal and grain, and they brought the sacrifices and the offerings, and they brought them to God, and God shared them. Some of those things God took. But it wasn't just God. The priests, they shared in the meal. And not just the priests, the whole community shared in the meal. It was a feast like they never ate otherwise. Feast. The Lord's Supper is a faithful feast of the grace in Jesus Christ. And he invites you this morning to come to the table. Take, eat my body, drink my blood. Confessing your hunger for grace, for forgiveness, for righteousness. Acknowledging coming with all of your spiritual hungers. And he says, come to the table. Well, let's stand for the benediction and close with our doxology. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. God's peace be with you. Amen.